It is my honor uh, to be here today, and, and I'm, I'm extremely thankful to CNEN uh, for the opportunity to be part of the class of 2021 Talented 12. Congrats to my colleagues and all the previous uh, T12 generations. I have uh, the great privilege to give you a snapshot of my journey towards a sustainable future for all through the lens of materials chemistry. And it all starts uh, back when I was in public high schools in Puerto Rico and in Bronx, New York. Uh, not only I was exposed to great teachers, great mentors, but also it was also the opportunity for me to learn English and Spanish that saw me really well throughout my entire journey. I also generated love for music like salsa and hip hop that later transformed into reggaeton. And if you wanna know a little bit more about the generations that uh, migrated from the Caribbean to New York City, dreaming big and asking questions later, you should definitely check out Lin Manuel's Mirandas in the Heights that had just recently uh, premiered. Now, this journey was habilitated uh, by the sacrifice, uh, by the dedication, by the love, the empathy of my family. And as you can see, my family might look a little different, but I see perfection. Uh, later down the road, uh, I had the great fortune of becoming the husband of Dr. Yvonne Ferrer La Sala. Uh, she, in my opinion, is the most talented analytical chemistry in the world. And also during, during this journey, I had the opportunity to be recruited by a very special program, the Math and Science Upper Bound Program. This program uh, recruited students from the Caribbean and from uh, New York City uh, to experience college as high school students and also expose them to research for the very first time. It was there when I uh, basically got the research bug. And uh, that inspired me to later uh, pursue a career in chemistry. I finished my bachelor's degree in the University of Puerto Rico at Calle. Uh, I, instead of going directly into graduate school, I worked in industry for a couple of years. And, but during those times, I was always daydreaming about all the research experience I had back uh, in, uh, in math and science for program, program in Buffalo, but also through an REU program. And it was then that Professor Luisa Colon in the University of Buffalo Wrote, me an, wrote us an email to me, Yvonne and me and said, hey, there's this program called NSF Fish to the Doctor Fellowship, and you guys will be perfect for it. We applied, we got the fellowship, and it so happens that around that same time, Professor Sarbajit Banerjee was beginning his uh, program on materials for thermochromics as well for batteries. I also remember the very first time that I drove into a national lab, specifically Brookhaven National Lab, knowing the noble laureates and also also other talented scientists worked there. So it was a, truly inspiring. Once I finished my PhD, I got again the opportunity to go to a really special place. Uh, they were starting a brand new project funded by the Department of Energy, the Joint Center of Artificial Photosynthesis. So my uh, uh, sort of lessons of building a new lab came to very good uh, use here. And it was thanks to the mentorship and guidance from Professor Nate Lewis and Dr. Bruce Brunswick, but I was introduced to the world of electrochemistry, photoelectric chemistry, and surface science. I just, ha I just want to note that it's programs like uh, Upper Bound, NSF Bridge to the Doctrine, NASA Harry G. Jenkins, four foundation fellowships that gave me the opportunity to have the access and the resources to now have a my program of my own at the University of California, Davis. So basically living the dream. Now, like uh, Ray Charles uh, saw in Georgia on my mind, I've always had Puerto Rico on my mind. And the reason why is because Puerto Rico is located in the Caribbean. This means that every year uh, Puerto Rico is susceptible for the passing of hurricanes. When a hurricane hits, often electricity and access to clean water becomes a commodity. And in the words of uh, my PhD uh, candidate, uh, Kamian Ritter, we now have the opportunity to be intentional on how and why we design materials. Materials that are gonna give us access to perhaps a net, a net zero emission and a climate resilient future. We've seen some examples here where, for instance, in the world of energy, photovoltaics are now providing us cheap electrons, cheap electricity that if you ask a catalyst conocedor like me, I'm immediately thinking about the opportunities to electrifying chemical synthesis and impacting uh, the uh, industries like transport and food security by uh, electrochemical reactions. 
Now, in my group at UC Davis, we are designing materials, characterizing them, and fundamentally understanding what do we need to do to establish the right type of structure function correlations for the functionality that we would need in the world of energy as well as water remediation. We combine chemical intuition and, uh, theoretical, uh, and theoretical calculations through very important collaborations for us to expand the library of new materials as well as understand their functionality. We take some of those design principles to also design surfaces that could be used as absorbents, perhaps to remove uh, perifluoroalkyl substances from water, as well in mobilization of uranium from iron oxide and nanoparticles. So a material that is near and dear to our hearts is the multinator metal calcogenides. And perhaps you are more familiar with the molybdenum disulfide family. But like Rold Hoffman showed us back in the 80s, just slight differences in composition between molybdenum and sulfur just expands the library of opportunities for us to be able to have different local coordinations that is going to have an implication on electrocatalytic function. Specifically, when you change that composition between molybdenum and sulfur, you basically unlock the uh, opportunities to get into the world of Chevrolet phases which are these cluster units that are comprised by molybdenum, uh, six octahedron encapsulating within the collagen cage. And when you look at the extended structure, there's abundant size for intercalation. In collaborative work done with the Musgrave team at the University of Colorado at Boulder, we've been able to expand and discover new uh, uh, Chevrolet phases, not only that are thermodynamically stable, but also uh, Chevrolet phases that are showing just new patterns in which we could do intercalation like the little site two that I'm showing you here in the magenta color. Now, in terms of function, there's just an abundance of um, uh, reactivity that we can unlock just by changing composition. These are the electronic ligand effects as well as fine tuning of active uh, site ensembles. So essentially, by changing the collagen cage, we can change the electron localization around the molybdenum, which is the binding site where key intermediates like carbon monoxide will reside. We, uh, we could also monitor the charge transfer from the intercalant into the collagen cage, as well as through electrostatic interactions, uh, uh, impact bonding configurations that will hopefully allow us to uh, impact uh, selective reaction trajectories in the world of, for instance, CO2 reduction or the reduction of hydrogen uh, um, to uh, the reduction of protons of hydrogen to produce hydrogen. So, so far, we've been able to synthesize materials across different dimension, uh, dimensions, as I, I've been able to show, use machine learning and theory to inspire our, our journey but also we're looking at ways of perhaps changing the stoichiometry of the intercalant and inducing semiconducting properties. We're essentially putting together the building blocks that perhaps will give us heterostructures that will allow us uh, to do very interesting electrochemistry and photoelectrochemistry. Now, how are we doing this? Well, we're using fundamentals of solid state chemistry to carry out the synthesis, but we're also using a hot pocket microwave to do this. And it's pretty remarkable the high temperatures and the high purities that we could attain uh, through these synthesis. I say we, but the real, uh, uh, the, re the real superstars here are Jessica and Joe, who have been able to, uh, through microwave uh, solid state synthesis, have been able to unlock a library of different compositions, different intercalations, substitution of, uh, of within the molybdenum 6 octahedron, as well as changing the dimensionality. Through the collaborative work that we've done with uh, the Musgrave Group at the University of Colorado, Boulder, we're also looking at theory and how it can inform some of the reactivity trends that we're seeing in our lab at UC Davis in terms of electrochemistry. I'm highlighting specifically here how the identity of the intercalant is impacting uh, the production of methanol from, from the electrochemical reduction of CO2. So uh, thanks to the work by uh, graduate student Nick, we are uh, designing uh, descriptors that are informing us in the laboratory of the kind of changes that we need to be able to do uh, for us to be able to trigger the active and selective uh, electrocatalysis that we are of interest. Uh, we also have the great fortune of having uh, access to the molecular foundry in the Stanford Linear Accelerator Lab, and students like Forrest and Brian are using X-ray absorption spectroscopy fundamentals to try to understand how perhaps this uh, oxidation state 
of uh, some of these molybdenum sensors change as a function of, of intercalation. As you can see here on the bottom left spectra, there's little to no change. The spectra looks pretty normal in terms of X-ray absorption spectroscopy. But it's not until we go and look at the sulfur K edge where we see a little bit of action. And in our world, we call this the pre-edge feature. That pre-edge feature that we are pointing uh, with this green arrow is showing that indeed, when you intercalate uh, something like copper, showing the black spectra, you get a depression of that shoulder. This is uh, evidence of successful charge transfer that is going that is happening from the intercalant into available sulfur 3P orbitals. This is important because it's a spectroscopic, a spectroscopic feature that uh, is going to allow us to monitor charge transfer within uh, uh, the material that would later uh, help us control the intermediates that we'd like to improve activity towards CO2 reduction. Thanks uh, to the collaborative work that we've been developing in the molecular foundry with David Pennergrass, Brian has been able to model uh, some of these pre-edge spectroscopic features and look at uh, under-coordinated size presented here in green and start us, uh, uh, us to start thinking about the population of orbitals and the charge transfer uh, of the intercalant with, uh, within the collagen and see if we can now have an opportunity to perhaps use an operando spectroscopy and try to understand the mechanism be behind the reduction of CO2 to the production of methanol. With that, I would like to take funding, uh, specifically uh, projects uh, funded by uh, the NSF and the Control Scholars Award. I've been truly fortunate uh, to have the support from the Solid State Materials Chemistry Program, as well as CBA Catalysis, all of the collaborators, uh, Stanford Union Accelerator and Molecular Foundry. But I want to take a moment uh, to say how proud and how fortunate I am of the team that we've been able to develop it at uh, UC Davis. It's a team that believes that, that we could lead, that we can follow, that we could do team science, uh, considering that uh, empathy and rigor can coexist. So thank you so much for your attention. And with that, I would be happy to take questions. Thank you for that wonderful talk. And since you ended on empathy and rigor coexisting, um, it sort of ties into what I wanted to ask you about, which is um, that my impression is that you're very committed in addition to your academic work to helping to foster the next generation of science scientists. Could you talk a little bit about some of the things that you've, um, that you've done in that area? And in particular, I hear that you still have a, a pretty open connection to Puerto Rico. Yes, uh, so we're doing several things, uh, uh, but uh, in terms of direct connection to Puerto Rico, thanks to funding uh, through the NSF, I lead uh, the NSF RU program uh, with, uh, with the support and co-leadership of Professor Annalise Franz. And I usually, I go once a year to different university uh, Puerto Rico campuses and talk about my journey, talk about the science that we do, that we do and uh, we try to provide that same sort of first opportunity I got uh, and ignite uh, research opportunities uh, 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 basically in the United States, specifically in UC Davis. But on campus, I'm also doing a couple of other things, uh, specifically uh, uh, teaching general chemistry. So I took the risk of, of teaching general chemistry to 400 students for the first time. Uh, um, year one wasn't so great. Uh, but but uh, but luckily, uh, with the guidance of Professor Brian Enderley, I was able to really get an understanding on how to teach the masses. And, and now we have co-classes that are helping first-generation low-income students uh, deal with the situation of having perhaps some uh, learning deficiencies, but at the same time, having the, the support, the belief that they are, that, that they fit with it, it, within, the, uh, within the structure doing all that in parallel and and we're seeing uh, uh some some great uh, uh students excelling uh thanks to these co-classes wonderful well thank you for sharing that with us since it didn't get squeezed into your talk so yeah. <laughs> thank you so much jesus